Okay, assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Hasna. I am the program coordinator for the International Movement for a Just World. And today I am joined by my friend here, uh, Mr. Ara, uh, Mr. Ara Konstanian, is that correct? Yes. Yes. Hi, okay. So today we'll be talking about the topic of um, Beirut itself when it comes to uh, the recent 4th of August. 2020 explosion in the port of Beirut. Now, as we're aware, the explosion actually came in two forms. One was the first explosion in a warehouse, which, which subsequently led to a secondary massive explosion, which had rocked the city of Beirut, causing a great amount of loss of lives, trauma and injury, as well as the costly catastrophic damage to the city. Brief background before we start. There were 177 deaths, 6,000 injuries, as well as about 300,000 people who have been displaced and $15 billion in property damage itself. Of course, the topics we'll be covering today has to do with the city of Lebanon, which had initially then descended into a state of chaos, many calling for those responsible to be held accountable. And the other side trying to maintain control and order while still investigating to this point about what happened and what caused the explosion. Now the situation is muddled in a lot of things and to an extent it's still um, being unfolded and the situation is still in flux. But there are many things that have happened along the way since then and I think that's the question that we want to actually discuss now. The main focus of our topic first will be about maybe who is responsible, who stands to gain what does this mean for Lebanon and what does this mean for the future of the region's geopolitics? But before that, um, Ara, uh, maybe I can ask you to give a brief introduction about yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Hmm. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm a ju junior fellow at National Academy of Science of Armenia Oriental Studies Institute. Uh, I, I write spe especially on Middle East, on Syrian war, on political Islam, and I publish my articles in Lebanon in Armenian uh, Astak newspaper. My analytic articles often are published there. I'm well aware of uh, Lebanon and I've lived there, I visited there. I have many cousins, I have many friends. We have very effective Armenian community there. Hmm. Okay, so given that you're very familiar with the nature of the politics that goes on in the region, uh, maybe I'll ask you about um, when the explosion happened, there was a lot of chaos about who had been responsible. What was the initial reactions that you actually experienced over there? Because in Malaysia, we understood that it was the ammonium nitrate that was stored inside the port of Beirut itself. It was, that was what caused the massive explosions. Um, but the question then came to mind about why was the ammonium stored over on that side? Uh, from what we heard, that the ammonium nitrate was all the items that had been confiscated from a ship back in 2014 and placed over there. And there was a lot of um, back and forth between the port officials and the government itself about how to safely dispose of the thing. But that is the ammonium nitrate. That's the secondary explosion that happened over there. The mystery, I think, uh, still comes around about what the initial explosion, because if you remember seeing those videos of the explosion itself, there was an initial explosion that had sparked in another warehouse that had jumped to the warehouse with the ammonium nitrate. Do you have any insights about what happened there? Okay, from the beginning, I would like to say that when the explosion came out, the first impression everybody had that this is something to do with Israeli attack. Mm -hmm. Even the, even those uh, uh, political or uh, social groups that they are keen to have normal relations with Israel, even though uh, that group, that side, uh, first impression was that this is something to do with Israel. Why? Because before that, before that incident, nearly every day, the Israeli warplanes were flying over Lebanon. Mm -hmm. 
that is one issue. The second issue that nearly 10 days ago, there was, there was an attack by Israeli jets on the mm. uh, southern part of the border because uh, they claimed that uh, Hezbollah fighters crossed the border and they, they started to, uh, to bomb some bases. And before that, uh, also in Syria, Israelis also uh, bombed by air some uh, Iranian uh, bases. And so this all together, the first impression of the people was that there is something to do with an Israeli attack. What about the video incidents and your incident that you have brought? Actually, there is two main, uh, three main uh, issues here regarding who's responsible or might be responsible. Because now we cannot say that it's 100% Israel, but we are doing some predictions and we are trying to come to the closer, uh, closer, uh, not solution, but to find, the, to try to find the closer incident to this mm. uh, catastrophic explosion. Mm. So the one is the ship was coming from France to Poland and it was meant to be crossed and to go to Greece or somewhere else. And that ship was uh, stopped at the port of Lebanon and it was not allowed to cross. We don't mm. know what is the reason for that ship. And they said that that ship was carrying that ammonium. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first thing is, the first option is this, that it's the ammonium was not saved uh, or in, in, the, in the port. Mm -hmm. So the ammonium was just going to cross the Lebanese Sea and go to Poland or go to Greece. Mm -hmm. The second one, as you have mentioned, that the ammonium, big amount of uh, ammonium, more mm -hmm. than uh, six tons or more. Mm -hmm. Uh, is stored in, uh, in in that port, but but the leader of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, in mm -hmm. his talk, he has mentioned that uh, they have nothing to do with this ammonium issue, mm -hmm. and it's not that they keep ammonium in this big amount in the port for more than uh, six years. You mm -hmm. know? And and where was the previous government? Uh, if this ammonium was stored there, where was the previous mm. government? Why they didn't blame uh, the previous government and now suddenly uh, blaming Hez Hezbollah for having uh, yep. uh, a chemical. Mm. Uh, the third one, uh, people say, some people say or think that uh, actually Hezbollah owned some uh, guns or yeah. some arms there. And when this ammonium in the ship or somewhere have exploded, the, 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 the arms that belongs to Hezbollah all together yeah. made a big uh, explosion. You know, uh, we have videos, we have videos from different people mm -hmm. and from, you know, on the, on the streets when the, next to the big supermarkets, you have this uh, mm -hmm. camera. Yeah. I will I will tell you three three different videos taken from different streets and the one uh, it's very interesting one woman uh, two women uh, walking on the street and one woman just pointing out her finger that something like an airplane is coming and then after a few seconds explosion okay so there was and, an airplane involved somewhere yeah the okay. another one Another one, there was a there was a man who was also like moving his hand like this, like it's an airplane. You know, mm, okay. the plane sound and again, okay. mm. and there is one, uh, one couple from balcony, just they mm -hmm. are taking videos just out of southern. Mm -hmm. And again, they they, they uh, the man or the woman says, what, "What what's this noise of an airplane?" And after a few seconds, this explosion. If if we combine all these three uh, videos, we can okay. conclude that there was an airplane there, and most probably their airplane, a military mm. airplane, uh, or or it was or it could be a missile, you know, mm, because yeah, okay. 
had another video that there is something like like a storm very very quick just down the pole. Okay. No, the big it, it's very interesting you mentioned this actually um, because um, there were some articles that came out recently that was being shared with us that talked about uh, a weapon that had been tested by the Israelis in Syria that actually was a form of a massive uh, high damage yielding weapon, a uh, catastrophic weapon that was used. And it created a very unique blast cloud that the weapons expert says that it's unique to that weapon. And this same blast cloud was actually observed when the explosion happened over in, in Lebanon. We are calling it mushroom, uh, mushroom blast or mushroom explosion because yeah. this blast, like a mushroom, is like covering all the air. And mm, yes. Also, that's that's why I mentioned that they attacked mm. Syria on some Ira Iranian bases, and yeah. that's why, they, yeah, the method was same. So all these predictions coming very close to Israel. Mm. And, and if you ask me why Israel have done this first. Mm. Uh, first to bring all the attention inside the Lebanese uh, political side who is against uh, who is against uh, Hezbollah and its allies to make pressure on him and to, to, to bring the attention of uh, international society and uh, Western countries to, to force uh, Hezbollah to hand over their guns and their arms because I believe Israel now is in a big trouble. Mm -hmm. Israel, Israel has a, a, one of the worst uh, records of coronavirus yes. in the region. Plus, we know that uh, the demonstrations against Netanyahu and many times he went mm -hmm. to court yeah. for corruption, not stopping. Corruption, yeah. And plus Hezbollah started to be much more stronger, and of course with its allies, after they won the battle against uh, Nusra and uh, Daesh in Syria, they became much stronger and their prestige is very high now in, uh, in, in the region. And uh, besides, of course, we know mm. that it also is uh, yep. Iran a major player in the region. So I they use this chance, and if we consider that this is an Israeli-made uh, scenario, mm -hmm. uh, it is. Uh, it's more. It's more. It's more possible. And if if we realize that just after the bombing, you know, just after like uh, how can I say, after a few hours, demonstration in Lebanon taking place, people on the streets are blaming Hezbollah. Mm -hmm. So this is this is something unlogical you know Hezbollah yeah. is not, is not an is not a foreign body in Lebanon it is one fraction from Lebanon uh, the Shia Shia community is uh, nearly uh, uh, as, uh, nearly close to the Sunni community I mean they are not outsiders that they are they are uh, <laughs> they are they came and they opened the political party yeah. but you know how come like your country your city is bombed uh, an explosion that comes the third now. First, uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, now, and this is the third one in the world now. And yeah. you just, yeah, and you just be instead of being worried about your country, about your situation, about your family, yeah. about your house, yeah. they you're went coming, protesting, yeah, you're protesting against against Hezbollah and blaming Hezbollah. <laughs> but what? So this is, I think, a well played scenario. You know, they hit mm. from outside, and they wanted to ignite this whole demonstration issue yeah. from inside. Okay. I understand. I agree. Um, it's actually very interesting you mentioned that because the question that well, we wanted to discuss after this was actually about who would most likely stand to gain from this scenario because it's true uh, what you mentioned about uh, Israel's role in the entire thing when it comes to Israel's position right now. There's a lot of things with Netanyahu going on inside. And you mentioned about his the protests, the allegations of corruption. His position of power in the Israeli government is currently shaky and unstable. And something like this would be useful to try and bolster his position on the matter as well. 
but the question then comes actually very interestingly to mind is uh, when the initial explosion happened, before even the protests and all these things, when the explosion happened, uh, Hezbollah itself was uh, actually very quick to deny that the Israelis were not involved in the explosion itself. The Israelis, of course, naturally were not only very uniquely, not just quick to deny their involvement, but to send humanitarian aid to the uh, issue, so the uh, situation. Now, actually, that's very unique because given the history of Hezbollah with Israel, um, suddenly you have them not uh, having an antagonistic but in an agreeable position. There was also when, after the blast happened, the city hall in Tel Aviv actually showcased their, the flag of Lebanon showing solidarity with them. So people were a bit confused about what's going on. Of course, naturally, later on, there were some hardliners who were uh, saying that Israel was involved. I think uh, one of them was the uh, ex-Lebanon uh, MP, um, Nohad Manchnok, I believe, that's if I pronounce his name correctly. Um, yes. But... Then comes the question, why was there the initial, immediately quick denial for that in, uh, of Israel's involvement? What prompted that matter? Because that was very unique. As I, yes, yes. As I have, uh, okay, Israelis are, you know, uh, they did such things before as well. If we can't, if we go back to the civil war during 70s, 80s, they entered Lebanon and they started to commit massacres. And later mm. they, they asked to, to some uh, cooperation and some agreement or some peace. You know, they, they are hypocrites and they, they never consider that other people are human beings. Mm -hmm. So their, their policy we know very well. But here, as I have mentioned, uh, they're not their policy, their attitude towards the others. Mm, yeah. you know, they consider themselves to be the uh, supreme uh, race in the world, chosen people by God. Mm, they yeah. create this story in their in their uh, religious book. You mm. know. Now, if we come close to the issue, as I have mentioned in the beginning of the program, okay, I will I will make it easier. There is two group. There are two group in in Lebanon now on, on political arena. One is uh, called. Uh, 8th March, that group is uh, Hezbollah, uh, that group consists of Hezbollah and its allies, also mm -hmm. Christian, there are also minority Sunnis, uh, there are Druze, I mean, it is not, mm -hmm. it is not like a uh, black mm -hmm. and white. Mm -hmm. And the other group is 14 March, again, you have, of course, the majority are the Hariri's uh, son, the Sunni leader who, who have been uh, assassinated in five who was the mm -hmm. previous um, uh, prime minister mm -hmm. so that, that fraction is more pro-western and pro mm -hmm. not israeli but they have no problem to to have a peace to peace sign peace. Yeah. yeah so i'm thinking what israel tried to first deny and later showed show this sympathy with the flag and readiness to send some aid mm -hmm. to that faction of uh, mm. uh, uh, 14 March faction, and at the same time, to some uh, some just uh, normal people who are fed up and tired of this uh, war situation. You know, sometimes people, sometimes you cannot blame the ordinary people. They are not experts. They are not politicians. Mm -hmm. Like me and you, we are experts. We analyze. You know, we think politicians. They think about some uh, method, some, uh, I don't know, uh, how to say, some, uh, uh, some plans to bring the country into better position. But ordinary people, sometimes they are very emotional and sometimes they, they just say, just, they just think, you know, mm -hmm. we're fed situation, we are tired of this uh, constant war situation, let Hezbollah, uh, disarm and let us sign a, sign a, a peace agreement with Israel, but they're not thinking that Israel has a Lebanese land still. They conquered Lebanese land, and I don't think they will, yeah. they will retain that land, and there are many other issues yep. as well. So, so this uh, sympathy 
uh, had two reasons, and I have explained. Mm -hmm. first, first, for that political party to show that we are ready. Mm -hmm. If you come to power, we are ready to to have support a peace you. agreement. We have to support you to support you in power. Mm -hmm. And add to the to the ordinary some ordinary people as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, that's actually very interesting because at the same time also I need to also take into consideration about where the blast happened as well because you mentioned that you know this uh, whole thing with Israel why they're so willing to give aid and things like that to show that the other side that they're actually sympathetic they are actually able to support them if they actually want to overthrow the regime as well oh, sorry overthrow do I mean to regime change sorry uh, because I think that's what a lot of people are pushing for when it comes to uh, the issue of Lebanon, especially with the power structure where Hezbollah is involved, especially their position as a military authority there. But the city of Beirut was a very interesting one because um, given the population dynamics of the city of Beirut, and do correct me if I'm wrong on this one, there's actually also a very large Christian communities over there. They're very much mingled together with the Muslim Sunni communities and all the other ones over there. So it's a very diverse the di diverse. Uh, uh, what they call it religious groups in the area. So when the blast happened, it also happened during a lot of uh, when Christian weddings were going off as well in various parts. So it really deeply affected the Christian community. So sometimes I can't help but feel that when the blast happened in the port to that magnitude, it was also in a way designed to cause chaos and discord and try to break in a sense that, um, how do you say, that social cohesive structure between the Christian groups and the Muslim groups over there to sow that much chaos into Lebanon itself. And I think I see, we are looking at some parts of that unfolding where uh, a lot of them are now trying to bash against Hezbollah, bash against the government, calling for resignation. Like you said, it was very strange as well about how fast some of the um, protests started happening. It was in a very organized and very well meticulously thought out method. And you can only really do that if you have you know, a lot of backing behind you for these things. And obviously, I think we there is evidence of foreign agents doing this sort of thing as well. So um, with that mentioned, I think we need to discuss about in the larger geopolitical scheme of things, who stands to benefit from these things? So and what are the strategies being used against the people of Lebanon in order to weaken their position, Hezbollah's position? Because I think at the end of the day, for me, it is about at the end of the day, like anything to do with foreign policy has to do with the state of Israel and the security of the state of Israel in the region. Because if we talk about even US foreign policy, pre-Trump, during Trump, all these things as well, the central question has always been about the welfare and the protection of the state of Israel in the region itself. And to me, from that point of view, um, this is all meant to undermine its enemies and secure its borders. So um, maybe if you want to share your insights on what you feel about um, like French President Macron talking about uh, things like calling for regime change for an fairly, you know, it's an elected government. As much as we have criticisms over the elected government uh, and of President Michel uh, Amon and all the others, the people of Lebanon have fairly elected their government, but suddenly there's these, all these groups trying to call on for regime changes. So, and I think that's part of the larger agenda. So what do you think this means for the larger geopolitical uh, environment? within Lebanon and on the state of Israel. Yes, first I would like to talk about the, commu uh, about the communities and uh, religion and different uh, races you have. That is, that's really a very interesting question because not many people know that how Lebanon although it's all the time uh, under the threat of war or civil war, but communities of different sects and religions and races, they mutually, the people, they don't have uh, any problem together. I mean, in Lebanon, I'm not Lebanese, but I have my mm. cousins and I live there. I have my friends. We have our churches, we have our schools, we have our political parties, and we have full rights. You know, uh, we feel better uh, 
uh, maybe much better than in many other European or American uh, uh, European countries or in US, you know, because mm -hmm. Armenians are spread around the world and we are very active in terms of uh, establishing not ghettos, but uh, communities, you know, mm -hmm. that is very much different. Yeah. So uh, we have we have very good relations with everybody there. The issue is not actually during the civil war. The issue was nearly uh, too much religiously involved. Mm -hmm. But this time, as I said, the two groups they have it's it's like a selection. They two groups they have uh, from all sects, even Armenian two main. Uh, political parties, one is on this side, the other is on the other side, you know? Yeah. So, uh, it's very unique, unique country. We call it uh, Lebanon as its uh, combination of East and West in one country. You have mm -hmm. the Eastern culture, you have the Western culture. I mean, mm -hmm. you have, uh, you can, in one restaurant, you can have fully Arabic food and in another mm -hmm. restaurant, have fully Italian food, you can drink uh, French wine, you know. Uh, so this selection is very unique and it's, it has its beauty, you know. Like mm -hmm. you have the American University and you have the state, another side, state university. You have uh, uh, Haigazian University, the Armenian University, which we have uh, many students from different sects. We have Sunnis, we have uh, the rules we have Armenians, we have you know, and the same in AUB. I will tell you something very uh, interesting. In American University, the majority of the students are Shias, and the majority are from Hezbollah side. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, interesting. And, yeah, it's very interesting. This is Lebanon, you know. You yeah. have this color, you have this selection. When I come to Malaysia, it's every time it reminds me of Lebanon, actually. Because you have this also uh, uh, Malay and Chinese and Indian. This you you found the right uh, method how peacefully and harmonious they can live together. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, this is my own uh, my own vision. I might be mistaken, but mm -hmm. I felt that. Uh, in Malaysia, the the governmental and the university educational things mostly it's given to Malay, and the business mm -hmm. is mostly given to Chinese and uh, medical and uh, nursing and law is mostly given to to Indians. This is mm -hmm. my expectation overall. I'm not talking mm -hmm. precisely. Uh, so they found the method that is that that is good. But what what about what is what is problem in Lebanon is that the Taif agreement that they have separated is uh, political positions. Mm. You know? For example, yeah. the prime minister must be from uh, Sunni and the president must be from uh, Alawi a Christian. Uh, you know, the uh, the uh, the speaker of parliament must be. Uh, Shia and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this problem, these uh, divisions started to create many problems, and youngsters are demonst mm. demonstrating before this for months. Yeah. You know, uh, they are they are asking to change the constitution and just to make it a normal constitution as the Western constitutions. Who, who for elections, who wins it can make the government can create the government. Mm. So. Uh, this this about community because many people these days who doesn't know about Lebanon much maybe in Southeast Asia Malaysia they but there are other countries who because they are not Muslim that's why they are not interested about that region much and mm -hmm. now they're interested because of this explosion uh, they're thinking that it's still a religious war or something like that mm -hmm. so not that, that has nothing to do with religion this this issue and the issues in the last uh, uh, 15, 20 years. Coming to the regional and geopolitical uh, question you've raised, of course, if you want to read Lebanon, you have to read Lebanon from outside, not from mm -hmm. inside. Because whatever happens in Lebanon, that 
like orders come from regional big powers and the, the link goes to 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 global now, you have mentioned about israel the role of israel in the region of course that is number one mm -hmm, yep. and we shouldn't forget syria oh yes region which is the one of the, the second important issue yes uh, i will ex I, I will explain it i will try to explain it this way Although now in Syria we have uh, the northern part, we have uh, Turkish occupation, the mm -hmm. Turkish troops are there. And although we have on the, on the border on Iraq, uh, we have the American uh, occupation forces. But overall, I believe that we won, uh, the government won the war against uh, terrorism because mm. now in jihadist takfiris we call it mostly mm -hmm. they are they are all uh, combined in one area mm -hmm. and in in idlib the city of idlib and that is that is i think uh, syrian government has some calculations their strategic calculations they are not starting to attack that area actually they they did a bit Mm -hmm. But I cannot say why they are still keeping them there. But overall, overall, they won the, the they won the war. Ninety percent of Syria is liberated. Mm -hmm. uh, no snipers, no bombs. Everybody is living their normal lives. Of course, now the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. yeah. the I'm not talking about that. Our our topic mm -hmm. is not on that. But uh, I believe that it, that's also pissed off Israel in a way, and mm -hmm. they try. To hurt their allies in Lebanon. Okay. So uh, on regional issue also uh, on Syria, as I as I as I have mentioned that because the war finished nearly there, they tried to transfer war in Lebanon. Yep. Okay. Uh, you got you got my point. Yes, I yes, mean, yes. I mean, if if in this area you're losing, okay, I tried the back door. Try the other one, yeah. What I create there. I agree. Okay. This is the, the, the also also the second uh, possibility of mm. that. Experience. What will come after that? Of course, they knew. Everybody knows that some people don't like Hezbollah, and some people will blame Hezbollah, and they also orchestrated that propaganda. Mm. And we don't know which groups are financing those people. We talk that they were on the streets. We we mm. don't have any. Yeah. But this. This is the method of George Soros, who does yes, this. Of course. <laughs> yes, George Soros is always in this. The same thing in, in Belarus, if you are following. Yes, yeah. So, uh, and, uh, and the third issue, which, is, which also has, uh, which is important to me also, is the Turkish factor there. Mm, yep. Because, mm. uh, because before this incident never happened such thing in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. uh, in a city which they have some uh, some people with Turkish blood, like their ancestors or from Ottoman Empire, their mixed marriages, and some people who are this these are the fanatic Sunnis mm -hmm. uh, who support who come support from directly Saudi Arabia and. Uh, mm -hmm. And now Turkey started to to have great influence. They're spending big big money there. They're they're paying for uh, university students tuition fees, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these people before this incident a few months ago, uh, we have very famous reporter on TV reporter, uh, Armenian Lebanese Armenian. He, he used a bad word against Erdogan and after a few hours yeah. these, these people were on the streets with Turkish flags and they wanted, of course it's, it's another city, but they wanted to come and attack uh, the Armenian mm -hmm. region. We, we will massacre you again and it was a big, big, big noise. Mm -hmm. So Turkey is using this not only against Armenians, we are, we are, we are enemies to blood, you know, they mm -hmm. committed in genocide and we yeah. lost our land when Armenia is still in Turkey. Uh, but they are using this to hurt our communities because they know that we are very organized. We have mm. in Middle East 
all over the world nearly we, we are very organized with our societies with our churches mm -hmm. with our political parties and etc yeah. they know that in middle east in middle east we are very organized and we are we, in number we are uh, maximum maybe 100000 people but in involvement we have huge involvement in lebanon in mm -hmm. business in trade in art in music you know mm -hmm. Arabs, they really like us. They really, if, uh, if Arabs, whether Christian or Muslim, mm -hmm. they really came in Syria. They really treated us very friendly, very bro brotherly. We came from genocide. My family came from genocide. We, don't, mm -hmm. we didn't have clothes on, 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 on us, no shoes, no food. Mm -hmm. you know? They gave us everything. They gave us all the, all the right, and we started to to build the, the country with them and to make it prosper with them. So that's why mm. the unique issue in Middle East uh, that Christian Armenians, they are uh, in brotherly relation with Muslims. This is very unique uh, issue in, in, in history, mm. I believe. Like in mm. Syria, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Jordan, Armenians all the time uh, consider like true uh brothers to friends and uh citizens not different from the from the locals mm -hmm. they to hurt also the turkey tribe first and they also want to get involved in ports if you if you see this now it's starting the uh, competition who will control over the ports mm, yeah okay uh, because the port in haifa if you know Mm -hmm. is uh, becoming one of the most important uh, ports in Middle East. They're spending mm -hmm. a lot of money, a lot of uh, projects and constructions taking there. Even even Chinese are involved mm -hmm. in that. So first, I think uh, if Israel, who has orchestrated, orchestrated this explosion bombing, mm -hmm. first, was of course, uh, that this if this important uh, port will be shut down for many many months and it will take sure. time to who will build so the Haifa port will take leverage on that area um, okay and the, yeah and I saw a map that there is coming from Gulf countries from Saudi Arabia and Emirates mm -hmm. there is there is a road uh, of a Port road, uh, like a uh, trade route, and mm -hmm. it's going to Haifa port. Oh, okay. So maybe this uh, peace they made with uh, Israel a few days ago that's mm -hmm. linked with with that trade projects as well. Mm -hmm. So one, so one that Haifa Haifa port gets the leverage on that region. Mm -hmm. It's also a one. Uh, our expectation and a French as you have mentioned Macron came is again because that port is one of the most important ports in that region and of course French will not uh, try to be lose the chance to get involved in construction maybe or to mm -hmm. have averages on on that port and again turkey also with big delegation they went to lebanon also they want to have their position in that port not only in that port in, in tripoli that i that i mentioned that uh, they have strong uh, turkish uh, support turkey has an has an uh, eye on that port they want to they want, they want to have some big control on that port so this mm. after explosion now is the competition who will who will uh, control, control. Or who some some uh, leverages on that for even the chinese hmm. they have even the chinese they have uh, announced that they are ready to to renovate the, the port the port from zero that's actually very interesting because um i personally also never considered the economical dimensions that you mentioned when it comes to the importance of the Beirut port and the Tripoli port over in Israel, uh, sorry, the Haifa port over in Israel and all that. Because at the end of the day, 
it makes a lot of sense about why they would like to have more involvement in those ports and also to control uh, what goes in and out monitor there's a lot of trade and power when it comes to ports like these and i think that's actually a good explanation about why there's a lot more involvement and external pressure about wants to control the government, controlling the port, controlling the trade route and systems like that. And it also puts into a very big perspective about um, the multitudes of things going on in the region, especially when it comes to the existential threats, as we can call it that, to the autonomy of uh, Lebanon in itself and towards about how they can maintain their autonomy. So I think that's actually very insightful. So thank you for sharing that, actually. Um, OK, I think. Um, Shouldn't uh, forget about the big powers. Yes. Know? Also, Russia. Uh, yes. It's, it's a fact that now Russia and Iran, uh, next to the Syrian army, who who made this uh, victory without mm -hmm. Russia, and it was very difficult to fight that war. You know. Yes. Really, from all the war, jihadists came in, and uh, the propaganda, and nearly one hundred twenty. Mm -hmm. 120 countries were were fighting diplomatic, uh, diplomatically and through media against the Syrian Syrian uh, government. So, mm. uh, of course, uh, Iran and Syria, uh, sorry, Iran and Russia uh, came in into this Lebanon problem. We shouldn't forget that first airplane aid arrived to Lebanon was the Russian. Russians. So this is not a small thing, it's a message, you know, yep. a so, message. So what you mentioned actually then, I think it's maybe quite accurate to actually say that what you were right to say about Syria initially, because initially the whole thing that happened in Syria from the first protests to all the way to the massive scale destruction and war that was caused by all these other powers that were using Syria as a uh, battleground, if you want to call it that already at this point, because Syria became a very interesting position about in the question of even, let's put it frankly, about the question of Israel's position as well. Syria was one of those focal points and battlegrounds to take up to actually determine maybe who gets to control uh, more power in the Middle East as well. And now that they've actually failed there in a sense because of Russia's involvement and of Iran's involvement and many other countries, I think it's safe to say also then that a lot of uh, external powers from Israel to the US and all the others were not able to make a foothold. So they shifted their attention now to Lebanon, like you mentioned as well, that they are yeah. now shifting that to a new battleground. So do you see Lebanon? Because right now it's still in the recovery phase after that explosion. But is it potentially that, that new geopolitical, uh, how do you say, uh, strategy now is to turn Lebanon into the next Syrian battleground. You know, I believe that it's not only became a regional issue now, Lebanon, moreover, it became an international, you know, mm -hmm. politically and uh, through media. All these two weeks, if you follow, you will see Lebanon, Lebanon, Lebanon. So, mm -hmm. so. Before what was Lebanon before this explosion? Let's say, let's call it like this. It was mainly uh, one part is uh, pro Iranian uh, Syrian, and the other part, as I have said, is pro uh, Saudi Arabian and uh, not against Israel and pro West. Mm -hmm. But that was very limited. That was the that was the role Lebanon was playing before this explosion, all these uh, 10, 15 years. But after this explosion, it, Lebanon became under uh, international attention and mm. super force came in. Uh, Russian airplanes came, uh, French president came. Mm -hmm. not, it, become not, it didn't uh, become only a regional issue. And the Chinese uh, Chinese message readiness to renovate the court. You know what I mean. So yeah, yeah. it became an international issue, and I don't think that it will go to any civil war. I don't. Yeah. I don't think. And uh, but if they start to put pressure on Iran and 
we never know. Maybe after one month, another explosion or something no. could happen. Yeah. Who knows? Similarly, we don't know. Or maybe some assassination, and again, they, they throw, they throw, they blame. Yeah. Uh, we don't know how it goes. But after these big powers all came in to help, I don't think that it will go to see more. Yeah, hopefully. But it's still and there. The issue also, one important issue also that. That's why I'm more relaxed. Uh, yesterday was the U in UN, that was the tribunal, international tribunal of mm. uh, assassination of Rafiq Hariri. Yep. Uh, and uh, the tribunal said that their, their decision was that there is any clue that Syria or Hezbollah was behind the assassination. Assassination, yeah. Which so the whole, the whole battle, political battle in this whole 15 years was trying to blame Hezbollah and Syria of that assassination. So mm. the Israelis were using that, pro-Western Lebanese uh, fraction was using that. Mm. So now they lost, uh, how to say, they lost their, the gun or the, uh, the clue that they could blame Hezbollah. Mm. So, that's why I couldn't, uh, I don't think that uh, it will go to civil war because now mm. Hezbollah has the credibility. Hezbollah now mm. can say, okay, okay, guys, you are blaming me all these all this years about this assassination. And now you see the international uh, tribunal belongs to United Nations. They, they have a decision that I'm, I don't have anything to do with that assassination. Mm. So this will also bring more credibility to Hezbollah's sides. That's that's mm. why I don't think that any uh, any tensions, uh, increased tensions will be or go to civil war. But I'm not denying it because, as I said, maybe they could make something and just again ignite the conflict. Yeah. So assassination, yeah. another explosion. We we never yeah. know what happens. But I mean, yeah. at, 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 uh, currently, at the moment, people are busy to, with renovating their windows. Yeah, their recovery. yeah everybody helping his, his community. Let's say our Armenian uh, youth, uh, youngsters are cleaning the houses, uh, volunteers cleaning the houses, cleaning the shops, the streets, uh, and the uh, and the politicians are visiting, the leaders are visiting houses and they are mm. uh, giving aid to the families who cannot, uh, who cannot mm. renovate the house or who yeah. doesn't have uh, mm. money to renovate mm. the house. So now they are busy with these uh, renovations and I don't think now something worse will happen. Okay. Um, all right. I think also, just on the last point for myself, it's true like you mentioned that we don't know what the Israelis are going to plan. Even speculation about this whole Beirut blasting as well. The speculation was that it was initially also still planned by the Israelis. If we recall in 2017, when Netanyahu went to the UN as well, he was showing the pictures and graphs about uh, yeah. whether Hezbollah was putting weapons in the port of Beirut. And then true enough, three years later, there was another an explosion that happened. So things Not like that. Now, uh, has mentioned a lot of times about that. I think that was in United Nations. Yes, that's right, in 2017. Yes, yes. So it makes you wonder about whether how truly deeply interested and involved they are in this thing and what is their next step and plan. Now that you mentioned about they lost their political ammunition, they lost their leverage when it comes to these things. So it's interesting about what they might do in the future. Um, but okay, I think we're actually out of time already, Aaron. So thank you for a lot. Uh, thank you for sharing a lot. It's, it's actually very insightful, especially on knowing about not only just the Armenians' position together with the uh, the Lebanese over there, but also talking about the larger political dynamics when it comes to the economy, to Turkey, to Syria, to all these things about how it affects Lebanon and Lebanon's strategic position in this possible new phase of geopolitical, uh, what do you call it, this political conflict that might be brewing up. But Lebanon has a lot of roles to play in that one, I feel. And you've brought a lot of insights as well, I think, when it comes to understanding why was the point targeted. 
about the ceilings, about the things to do with um, the, the issue of economy, about the why there's so much interferences and things like that. But at the same time, the other factor of the social network, the social structure of the people of Lebanon itself playing a part of that and why it's important for it to hold together as well. Um, so yeah. with that, um, would you like to say any uh, closing remarks on your side? Yes, uh, although it's not related with Lebanon, but mm. we, we've talked about that uh, peace, peace agreement or normalization, normalization with uh, with Israel, you know, Emirates, between Emirates mm. and Israel. I mean, and you know that this three, four days, Israelis are uh, bombing Gaza heavily. Yep, so, yep. I mean, I don't understand. These Gulf countries, they are, they are Arabs, Muslims, friends of Palestinians or friends, friends of Jews. This is something already is making people sick of it. It's enough, you know. How, I mean, instead of its logic, now Israel is not in that good positions like used to be 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, you know. Now everybody knows that Israel is losing ground, as I have mentioned some points. Now, instead of you all Arabs uh, unite together and put pressure on Israel to have free Palestine, you are giving hand to Israel and making him stronger and going to normalization uh, uh, process. And I've, I've read on uh, I've read on news that uh, most probably other countries with Gulf uh, in Gulf will follow this normalization officially. Mm, yeah. I mean, it cannot. Cannot be, you know. This is this is mm -hmm. uh, this is something out of logic. Yeah, we're also afraid of our side as well because the young people uh, don't go has relations together with the I mean, of uh, the UAE as well. So we're wondering on our side, will this become a normalization of our end? We don't think so. But where is this trend going to go at this point, and what's it going to mean for the Palestinian people at the end of the day as well? <laughs> Okay, so in any case, um, if that's it, I think uh, we can end the recording here. Thank you very much again, Arad, for uh, sharing you. And uh, we can probably do this again. We'll see how the situation develops because obviously this thing is going to go on for some time, especially with Israel still trying to secure its position in the region. So we'll hope to see you inside. Middle East is like a net Netflix series. It's <laughs> all the time. all the time there is something. <laughs> yes, there is never ending. There is always something happening. So I'm sure we'll be meeting again and discussing more on uh, things that goes on in the Middle East. My pleasure. Right. Thank you, Arad. Thank you very much. Thank you.